Okay, so so yeah, this this last part of the the talk here is about this um about post tracking. So I mentioned and I I showed you that um a lot of our analyses are are based on um you know behavior video, right? So so record some 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 video. Um, try to figure out from the video what the what the mouse is doing, and then correlate those th those behavioral signals back onto the brain. And that's that's kind of the the, the game plan, or or vice versa. Try to go from you know neural signals and decode those into estimates of of behavior. Um, and so these these tracking methods have become kind of completely critical to to the IBL goals and and to the goals of of many many scientists in the world. Um, so we we really wanted to to make this this post tracking as 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 accurate and as robust as possible, um, and the details of that again are are in this this paper. Okay, so let me let me let me dive in here. So so as I as I just mentioned, um, post tracking has become you know completely central for a lot of the the IBL goals. Right, we we're using behavior as as kind of a a critical kind of kind of probe into neural activity. Um, I didn't go through the details of this, but we we see clear kind of dependence of of some of the behavior on on the the prior that that were estimated as well. Um, so there's there's some nice analyses you can you can do there. Um, we haven't talked about this at all yet. This is really a project that's that's just getting going. But for every single mouse that that I just told you about in the brain wide map data set, we have about thirty or so learning sessions. Um, mice do not learn this task very quickly, so we have access to to many different, many many sessions of of behavior during the learning of this task, um, which we've just started to probe. And so, um, you know, over the next year or so, we're excited to 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 dig into this behavior during learning in in, in much more detail. Okay, so so again, just to kind of give you give you the setup. Um, we have three cameras on, on each of the animals, each of the mice, um, two side cameras, one from each side of the face um, that pick up things like like the pupil or the paw location. We measure the motion energy on the whisker pad. We look for, for licking and, and for kind of nose wiggles. Um, and we're going to train. Um, well, we started out by training deep lab cut, um, multiple different deep lab cut kind of uh, networks to, for example, track the paws or zoom in on the on the pupil camera and track the the pupil diameter. And we did that just by kind of placing a, a diamond of of markers around each each pupil, um, and we're going to try to track the the diameter of of, of that diamond. Um, we look for when the the tongue is out. Um, we look for for nose wiggles. Um, and and again, there's this then a, a huge amount of effort um, from from Matt and others in the collaboration to to iteratively develop training labeled sets, retrain the models, look for errors, add more labels, do more retraining um, until we get something that that mostly works. All right. So this has been a huge effort. Um, and I, I think, you know, if, if you haven't done post tracking on your own data before, I think it's easy to kind of read the papers and the literature and think, oh, this is going to be pretty easy. Um, and and it, it, it has not been easy. Um, that, that's that's one of the, the, the messages I, I want to convey here. Um, so just, just to kind of, you know, get you situated, there's a huge number of, of post-tracking papers out there. Um, they all go something like this, right? You look at a, look at a video, um, look at a, a frame of a video, um, decide what you want to track. You know, maybe you want to track each of the paws in these two views of the same animal here. You add a few labels and then you train a neural network to kind of, um, apply those labels to to other frames, other unlabeled frames in the in the video, and, and again, you know, you can get pretty good performance already just with a hundred or so labels. Um, but if you want really good accuracy, um, you're, you're going to need to add add more labels using kind of you know currently available technology. Okay, I'm going to skip over some of the the details here, but but very briefly, um, the way these you know classical models, you know. Classical being, you know, um, in the last five years or so, this is a pretty fast moving field. Um, but the the quote classical model is basically taking an image, um, push it through some kind of you know neural network backbone, um, and then basically output um, estimates of of where the paws should be, um, and then you do training by comparing where the paws are, are output to where they they actually are based on your human labelers. 
um, you, you minimize some kind of supervised loss and, and you try to train up this, this network so that it does a better job. Okay, so I think most of you are pretty familiar with this technology and I won't go into much more detail there. Um, all right, let me skip ahead a little bit. So, so as I mentioned, you know, these, these methods are great for kind of getting started with post tracking. Um, but when you really want to kind of trust every every frame that's coming out of these these methods, you know you run into some problems. Um, so one issue is that you know they're they're quite data hungry, as I already mentioned. You have to you know do do thousands of of, of labels to 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 get it to a good kind of level of of performance. Um, that's that's a problem. That's not great. Um, but you know you can always kind of throw money at the problem and, and hire more labelers. Um, so I think that's problem number one is kind of solvable. Problem problem two is is more critical, I think. Um, so we we encountered issues like this, right? Here's here's a video um, where, where we actually kind of, we, we didn't label these frames, but we labeled other frames from the same video as part of the, the, the training set. Um, so, so in fact, we had five different IBL labs contributing uh, labels here. Um, we had about a thousand or so labeled frames. Um, and this was this is one of the, the labs that was contributing to the, to the labeled set. And so after about a thousand frames, we get pretty good, not perfect, but pretty good tracking of, of each individual paw here. The problem is that if you then grabbed a different lab uh, from, the, from the same university, um, you got very bad tracking, right? So you know, we, we we looked at this and it's like, you know, what what the hell is the network thinking, right? The the, the pause right there. Why why is this a hard thing? Um, and this is this is something you see all the time with with you know neural nets. They perform very well in distribution, on the on the distribution where the the label data is, is coming from. But if you ask them to generalize outside of that that distribution, you know, just due to very subtle differences in lighting or pose or other aspects of the the textures in this video. Um, the, the model does this quite poorly all of a sudden. Um, and you can quantify that here, right? If you if you plot the, the pixel error obtained on test data from within the label distribution, um, that pixel error is going to drop very quickly. Um, but then if you look at, you know, but then if you look at other videos outside of that distribution, um, you see that the, the, the pixel error drops very, very slowly even up to several thousand kind of data sets, you're still kind of getting significant improvements here. Um, so this is something that, that I want you all to kind of keep in mind as you're applying these, these methods, um, this difference between kind of in distribution and out of distribution errors. Um, we, we see this in our data, but we also see it in, in multiple other data sets that we've looked at. This, this large difference between in distribution test error versus out of distribution test error. Are there any questions on that? I wanna make sure that point is clear. All good? Okay, all right. So that's that's a problem. Um, another problem, I think, if if you've used these methods, you've probably noticed that that sometimes tracking is great, but every once in a while, there's kind of a weird glitch um, where you know we we don't. This is this is a, a paw we're tracking. We don't actually think the paw has teleported for from for one frame from one position to another. We think this is kind of a, a tracking error. Um, and in fact, if you look at the the confidence that this that this network has about its um, about its estimates, it's quite confident that that the paw is here, even though we we actually think the paw should actually be down here. Um, so it's it's not sufficient to just kind of you know threshold and try to try to just look at the the confident frames. Um, the, the network actually makes some some pretty confident errors here as well. Okay, so that's that's a problem. Um, and you know we and others have played with some games with with trying to take. Take these traces and, and look at the confidences and look at the smoothness of the trace and and try to fiddle with the output of, of these networks and try to correct them. Um, in, in the end, we were pretty unsatisfied with with these kind of post hoc methods for kind of correcting these these glitches. Um, I, I think you know something more fundamental needs to be kind of fixed here. And then the the fourth thing we notice is that the the networks are are highly unstable. All right, so if you if you take exactly the same network architecture, exactly the same labeled data set, and just initialize the the weights differently four or five times, and and run exactly the same training, exactly the same data, exactly the same architectures, just with different initializations, you get wildly different networks. All right, and that's that's shown here. Um, again, this is kind of two views of the same mouse. 
um, performing a simple walking task. So maybe just just pay attention to the the top view here. Basically, each each dot corresponds to the output of of a of a different network that was trained in this in this kind of identical ensemble. And what you see is that whenever the network, whenever there's an occlusion, whenever the network becomes less certain about where the where the the paw is, um, you see a wide variety of of kind of um, outputs of of these different different networks. Um, so even though the network was trained exactly the same way, um, it, it has wildly different output on these kind of problematic frames. Is that clear? Okay, so. You know, as as we were trying to set these methods up to perform tracking in the ideal data set and in other data sets we were interested in, we, we kept on kind of running against these issues and, and eventually we got frustrated and said, okay, we're gonna we're gonna try to fix this. Okay. Um and so again, I don't want to go through the the, the the full details of this paper. You should you should take a look at, at, at Matt's paper if you're curious, but but let me kind of give you a couple of the of the highlights. Um I'm gonna, I'm gonna skip skip some frames here. Um, yeah, so let's let's see. <clears throat> so so one big idea is is instead of instead of the the standard approach, which which only kind of um, trains on on supervised data, um, the only loss that these these classical methods use are, are using basically um, you know the 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 labeled data. We wanted to to take advantage of other learning signals as well, right? So we want to penalize the the network when it makes a glitch, or or when it predicts something that's that's kind of obviously wrong. Um, and the the advantage there is that we can take advantage not just of the small hundred or thousand kind of um, labeled frame data. We can actually take advantage of the millions of unlabeled um, frames that we have, right? So we're, we're going to want to estimate kind of make estimates on, on all the unlabeled data sets, create some kind of quality metrics on those labeled data sets, on those unlabeled frames, and then add those to the to the training set, essentially. Um, so we're going to add some unsupervised losses um, on, on the, the large majority of, of frames where we don't have labels, right? And the kinds of things we we, we kind of care about, again, are kind of the, the temporal continuity of, of the, the traces that we estimate. Um, we care about multi-view consistency, right? So if we're observing the same video, the same behavior from multiple um, cameras, basically the behavior should be consistent on those cameras, right? So that's that's a that's a very natural kind of consistency we can add. Um, uh, we, we don't want we don't want the the nose to appear on the foot, right? We we, we have some kind of notion of, of plausibility of of poses that we can we can we can penalize as well. So we developed losses that kind of penalize each of these different kind of errors um, and then added them to the the network during training. Um, so that the network was was trying to make the, the supervised data look correct, but also trying to make all the unsupervised data look correct as well. All right. And that's that's going to be helpful. The other thing we did is um, you know, again, introspectively, when we look at and and try to label individual markers on on these on these videos. Sometimes it's very clear where the paw is, um, and on other frames it's not clear where the paw is. Maybe the paw is 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 off screen, or maybe it's maybe it's hiding between um, behind. Um, maybe it's occluded behind something else, um, or maybe it's just not clear. You know, am I looking at the the right paw here, the left paw? I'm I'm not sure. Um, but if you allow yourself additional temporal context, if you look at multiple frames. And kind of scroll back and forth. You can kind of quickly um, correct errors that you might have made on individual frames. All right. So that's something we can build into the architecture. Instead of giving the the network a single frame to make decisions on one at a time, let's give the network multiple frames. Maybe maybe not just one frame, but also the the two frames on on either side of that frame, um, and give that give the network additional context um, so that it can make better decisions. Right. So that's that's something that's that's pretty easy to do. And then third, we can we can take that um, network instability problem that we mentioned before, and and you know turn it from a, a bug into a feature. All right. So so how do we do that? Well, we can we can train an ensemble of of whatever architecture you like. Train you know five of those networks using randomized um, you know initializations, but using exactly the same training data. Um, and then use the the kind of ensemble output to give you a sense of where the hard frames are, right? So in, on, in many cases, 
these these networks will have exactly the same output and you say okay i'm i'm, I'm pretty sure i know where the where the paw is on those frames um but on other frames maybe maybe the network um these these five different networks in the ensemble give wildly different answers right and and that's going to give you a sense of you know that ensemble variance is going to be a very useful signal where instead of you know paying attention to the what the network is doing there maybe we should default there and and pay more attention to our priors about about how the paw should be moving smoothly in space or how it should be consistent with with the view in the other camera there, for example. So we can put this ensemble variance together with some very simple kind of constraints on on the smoothness of of the of the trace, for example, or the multi-view consistency. Put that together into a very simple kind of state space model um, and obtain much, much more robust tracking. All right, so that's that's what I'm showing here. Um, the the red dots are just just what we had before, kind of the ensemble of of multiple networks given given different answers. And you see, there's there's quite a lot of variability, in particular on these on these hard frames where there's a bit of occlusion between the frames. Um, and we put those that that variance signal together with with a, a very simple kind of model of of smoothness across across frames to get this this green trace right so the the, the green marker is showing the the output of this essentially this, this smooth version of this ensemble and you see that the the green dot is now tracking much more reliably much more robustly than what, what we had before is that cool basic idea is clear there any questions training um your you're training multiple models, and then you uh, smoothen, you combine them in an ensemble and smoothen the output. Is that fair to say? Um, but if the models are trained, if they are qualitatively the same type of models, right, and they are trained on the same video, shouldn't they be quite similar in their output? Does the ensemble bring a lot to the table versus training a single a model of that type. Yep. Yep. Yeah. I'll, I'll show you in a moment that this this helps quite a lot, actually. Um, it, but you can kind of see it already, right? So the ensemble, you know, whenever the red dots spread out here, that's the ensemble being a little bit confused about about where things are. Um, and so, but but on, on most trials, again, you can you can see that the ensemble is 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 quite confident, right? All of the red dots are in the same place. So on those frames, we, we essentially don't do anything. We 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 have a small ensemble variance, um, a strong likelihood, and and the the output of this of this smoother is basically going to pay attention to to what the what the ensemble is doing there. It's it's only when the ensemble becomes more uncertain, when the when the likelihood term gets gets weaker, essentially, that we default back on the on the prior and and essentially add more smoothing on those frames. Okay. Um, so yeah, it's it's a little bit surprising, but this is this is a well known thing in in the neural network literature. Um, you know, we're we're trying to minimize a, a very highly non convex, high dimensional objective surface, and if you initialize in in five different places, you're gonna you're gonna get five different outputs essentially. Um, and on some frames, those 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 neural networks will say exactly the same thing, but on many frames, they'll say something wildly different. Um, of course, as you add more and more labeled data, as you add more more training data, this ensemble variance will decrease. Um, but we found that even after several thousand labels, this this ensemble variance can still be quite quite large. Very cool. Thank I'll you. I'll show you more examples. Any other questions? Okay. Um, so again, check check out the paper for for some details. But um, let's let's go back to you know the the IBL data that we we know and love. All right, so let's let's zoom in on on the eye here and see how well um, we were originally tracking the, the 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 pupil. All right, so this is the output of of you know deep lab cut with with lots of data, um, kind of as, as good as we could make it. All right, so remember we're trying to kind of put a diamond around the 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 borders of the pupil here, and then we're just going to measure the. The, the the pupil diameter from by by taking the diameter of of this diamond, um, and if if you look at this, you know often we're we're kind of missing something down here, very very not confident about where this lower marker should be, um, basically because of this this reflection that's kind of in the way from the the IR lamp, um, but you also just see a lot of a lot of variability whenever there's a whisk, the network kind of goes crazy and isn't isn't sure what to do, um, this this pupil tracking is is really not 
ready for prime time. It's it's not it's not good enough to, to kind of make scientific decisions about downstream, right? So we were we were pretty unhappy with this, and even after quite a lot of effort and, and giving it more and more training data, retraining it many times. Um, so that's not great. So now let's now let's compare what we get with this this new method. Um, you know, using these 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 methods that I just told you about very briefly in the last few slides. Um, so again, the the green is the output of of deep lab cut. The the purple is the output of this of this method. Um, and what we see is that the, um, the the tracking is much more stable. We're able to kind of ignore those those glitches that happen when the when the, the whisker goes by. Um, and even though we have this this kind of occlusion based on this 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 IR lamp, um, we're, we're still able to kind of do a pretty good job of of tracking over time. All right. So this is you know one example of of literally thousands um, that we have access to. Um, one of the the big kind of challenges here is is trying to get a sense of of how well we're doing at a, at a population scale. Um, so we can do things like you know just just look at where these these this this diamond was placed over the the course of of the whole experiment here in a, in a single session. And so you see that you know deep lab cut makes a lot of these weird kind of outliers where it's it's not really sure where it should go, so it kind of defaults to this weird position up here. Um, and as you as you add more information to the the network and and add on this 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 Kalman smoother, um, you you get a much much better kind of um, registered kind of locations um, across across the session. Um, you can also do things like you know let's let's take a look at the pupil diameter um, across multiple multiple sessions here. So here we're aligning to kind of the, the, the feedback onset. So when the animal is is rewarded um, or not rewarded. Um, and so you can see that you know we're we're doing trial matching here. Um, so this this is a single the the green trace is a single pupil diameter trace from the from deep lab cut. Um, this is a a, a single um, trace from from this, this this lightning pose estimator. And you can see across across multiple trials here um, the, the the there's a huge variance from from deep lab cut, which is much much smaller um, from the new method, right? And then finally, you can you can kind of perform some some internal checks, right? So, so if if we're doing a good job, the um, the horizontal diameter should be very very highly correlated with the the vertical diameter, right? And so we can we can plot that. Um, so here's you know kind of a a heat map of that distribution um, from from deep lab cut. You see that the the correlation is kind of alarmingly small here. Um, if you if you perform some of these these tricks that we've we've added in, in the lightning post paper, this this correlation gets gets much stronger. Um, and if you and if you cheat and enforce those constraints by, by fiat, of course you can make you can make the uh, the correlations go up to go up to one here. Um, so the the final output here um, in this in this purple trace that we're showing um, is actually enforcing those those constraints um, as as part of the as part of the output of this of this common smoother. Does so that all make sense? Okay. So, so Matt is going to kind of walk you through some more of these these details in in his session this this afternoon. Um, I guess one last thing we can do is is compare the the decoding accuracy. If we if we take neural data, try to map that into our S of, of the pupil diameter, um, and and compare across multiple sessions. If you compare the the deep lab cut accuracy to the lightning pose accuracy. So the lightning pose plus the Kalman smoother accuracy, you see that we kind of get pretty significant improvements in, in the decodability as we as we add in these these kind of improvements in the in the the pose tracking kind of kind of pipeline. All good. Okay, um, so so that's that's most of what I wanted to say about the the, the pose tracking stuff. Um, check out this 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 GitHub link. Um, we've got kind of a whole kind of Ecosystem of of tools set up there, um, and and again, uh, Matt Matt is really the the boss of this project, so you should you should ask him um, any any questions. All good. Okay. No further questions here on on post tracking. All right, great. So um, I guess for the 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 last part of the talk. Um, I wanted to kind of open things up a little bit and and just chat about 
you know, the, the, the pros and cons of, you know, working as, as part of a kind of a, a large scale collaboration. Um, so just to kind of get things started um, from a, a recent grant review, um, we were asked to kind of, I don't think any of you have probably heard of, of a SWOT analysis. Um, this is something, it's kind of a business or consultant speak. Um, but, um, you know, this is, this is an exercise that we had to go through. Um, and it's, it's, it's kind of useful um, just as a starting point to, you know, a conversation I, I hope we can have here. Um, so this is, you know, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and, and threats um, to, to, to IBL. Um, but but it, we, we kind of fleshed this out with some of some of the things we liked about IBL, some of the things we, we didn't like so much, um, some of the, the kind of directions we hope to go in in, in the near future, um, and, and I think some of the some of the problem areas, some of the the, the threats that we see um, as, as as part of this this collaboration. Um, so I can I can maybe say a few words about about these, and you know if if you guys have 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 questions, it'd be great to have more of a more of a conversation here. Um, Maybe I'll just I'll just leave these up. Maybe it's maybe it's a little too much for me to go through these these individually, um, but um, but I'd, I'd be happy to kind of chat more about any any of these details. But yeah, maybe maybe it'd be it'd be more fun if you guys start asking questions. So there's there a question in the back there. Um, yeah, thanks. Um, I guess I a question that kind of came out of our break a little bit and whatnot can maybe boil down to is is there such a thing as too much data? Um, where, <laughs> okay, it, the the question is answered. Then there is such a thing as too much data. Um, does yeah, it? I and and, it, I, and maybe if you yeah, could tie it together to some of the threats that you've outlined here, like there, there's this opportunity now to collect, you know, uh, almost unmeasurable amounts of data, which seems like maybe requires a different kind of. Um, team structure like i'm seeing under the threats here challenge to balance large scale collaborative goals and individual trainee career developments which i think is maybe pointing to the fact where you have these huge reams of data and huge complex projects um and for trainees you need to be first author on a paper or something like that but there's 40 authors on a paper and how do you carve up those kinds of um, who contributed what and whatnot? The, the, all these things seem to be in conflict right now to actual progress. I wonder if you have any thoughts on that. Yeah, yeah. So I think there's a kind of a couple questions embedded in there. So I'll try to try to unpack that a little bit. So I guess to get started, maybe it's maybe it's helpful just to discuss how we tried to set this up. So we we've been very aware of these challenges. Um, so the the way that IBL is set up. Basically, it's it's this collaboration across multiple labs, 20, 25 labs. Um, we have some core funding that supports staff, which which are not kind of within an individual lab, but are, are rather kind of shared shared across labs. Um, and then, we, of course, we also have many kind of postdocs and, and students within each each lab. Um, so so the the deal is that you know if if you want to join IBL. There are some costs and benefits, right? So the benefits are, you know, you get to join this. I think it's 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 an amazing, you know, collaboration with with a huge number of of diverse strengths. So there's 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 great kind of training opportunities. Right? You you get exposed to lots of lots of great science, lots of you know fun people. Um, the, the the data opportunities are, are kind of unmatched. Um, the the trade off though is that you have to contribute, right? We don't want people just to kind of Grab the data and run. Um, so, so people need to contribute to um, one of the kind of large scale platform projects. So each each of the each of the projects that I, I told you about today are what we call platform projects. They're they're large projects that are, you know, couldn't really be done within a single lab. Um, that are, are you know, kind of a something that you know only only a collaboration of of the IBL scale or greater could kind of achieve. Um, so these these reproducible re, reproducible behavior and EFIS papers those were those were platform projects. The brainwide map that's that's a pro platform project. Um, I, I mentioned I think this this learning project that's just getting started that's going to be kind of a a, a collaboration wide um, project. Um, so if if you want to be part of IBL you have to kind of 
contribute meaningfully to, to one of those platform projects. Um, and then you can kind of go off and, and do your own thing, right? So if you're an experimentalist, you can use the technology that IBL has developed um, and maybe build upon that um, to, to do your own experiments. Um, if you're an analysis person or a theory person, you can grab any of the unpublished IBL data um, and, and use that to test your own theories or use that to kind of um, test your own methods for, for pose tracking or, or spike sorting or neural decoding. Um, and, and so that's that's kind of the, the, the trade-off. We want people to, to contribute to these platform projects, but we also want to make sure that people are, are doing their own kind of individual work as well. Um, and and you know, doing their own science that kind of builds on these platforms. And and finding the balance there is um, something that's that's a bit of a moving target, right? So um, you know, Matt was was one of the members of the the brainwide map task force. Um, and he can tell you that there's there's been lots of challenges in pulling all that data together, trusting the results, um, you know, being careful not to include bad data. Um, pulling it together into something that, you know, is, is a resource that, that the community can kind of, you know, believe in and, and use for their own purposes. Um, I was on the, the Repro EFIS task force where we spent lots of time talking about quality control and, and you know, thinking about what are the, what are the most kind of informative analyses that we can apply to this, this data set um, and which, which parts of the data set should we share and which parts, um, you know, would be better not, not, to, not to see the light of day. Um, and, and so there's, there's kind of a, a balance that, you know, PIs and trainees have to, have to find. And that, that really varies across the life scale, the lifetime of, of a project, right? Sometimes you need to put a lot of effort into your individual things. Sometimes you need to put a lot of effort into your, 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 your kind of platform project to, to make sure that's, that's viable. Um, so hopefully that answered some of your questions. You, you also had a, a point about, you know, how much data is too much, um, which, which I think is a great question. I, I think this depends a lot on what you're trying to do, right? So if if you're trying to develop a new neural decoding problem or a new neural decoding kind of kind of tool, probably you don't need to apply this to a thousand data sets. Maybe it's enough to apply it to 10 or so data sets and make sure that it works across a few different brain regions. And then you can go ahead and kind of share that with your friends and, um, and be happy. Um, but some projects do require, you know, full scale, right? So, so the, you know, we have many data sets, but those are distributed across what what's really a, a pretty big brain, right? Even though mice are very small, right? So, so if you look at the number of of penetrations that go through some of these smaller, more obscure brain regions, it's still pretty small, um, and so to get brain wide coverage. Um, you know, you, you you do need to you do need to collect a, a fairly large data set, and that's going to require um, you know quite a lot of investment, either from from multiple labs or from kind of a dedicated brain observatory. Um, and and so there there's 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 plans I think to develop these these kind of you know specialized observatories and, and, and try to make that more of a more of a resource. Right, the the Allen is is one such observatory. Um, but the, I think there's there's discussions to kind of open up more of these um, around the world. Um, so hopefully that addressed at least some of your questions. Um, let, let me know if that was close. Um, yes, hi Liam. Um, uh, thank you for your talk. Uh, I have two questions. One relates to what uh, was asked just now. I'll start with, with this one. Um, it's more of a concern, maybe, and I see it's not on the list here. Uh, so uh, when you talked about uh, putting things into a standard and you showed that if you do this uh, quality control, uh, it was one of your examples, then you can not decode uh, so much uh, which lab was it uh, that was doing the experiments, but when it take all the data, then you start to distinguish between them, which uh, might suggest that there is some footprint uh, of the labs, and this could be related to maybe some uh, systematic error or stuff like that, but one thing that concerns me is that once you do this normalization, 
then you might actually miss uh, some important uh, variables that uh, emerge uh, once you cut the data, you know, and fit it to some uh, normalized data. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. Um, yeah, so let me, um, I guess there are a couple, we, we've, we've seen this kind of in a couple of different ways, right? So um, one, one kind of large scale meta point I want to make is that you know, these, these technologies are still pretty young, right? So I think, um, you know, Neuropixels was, was only kind of released several years ago at this point. Um, and it's, it's very clear that, you know, we, we as a field need to invest more in improved spike sorting methods and, and you know, being, being confident in the, the units that we're extracting from, these, from this kind of magical new technology. Um, I think video tracking, um, there's, there's been a, a, a pretty long history of, of video tracking, but there's, there's certainly kind of a step change about five years ago when DeepLabCut was, was released, right? These, these methods have become immensely more popular um, and, and more widespread now. Um, but it's, it's still, you know, as, as we discussed just a, a few minutes ago, it's still kind of a, an immature technology. There's still, you know, large improvements that, you know, we and others are, are, are pursuing. Um, and so, so again, you know, going back to this, this, this slide, this, this is a, a bit disturbing, right? Um, you know, if, if you're basing your scientific conclusions on a method that's, that's clearly very, very noisy, you're, you're going to miss things. And, and maybe you're going to miss brain regions that are, are highly informative. Um, and so, yeah, I, I, think, I think paying close attention to the quality of the data and investing significantly in, in improving our methods for, for extracting signals from, from the brain and from behavior um, is, is super critical. Um, and so, so again, if, if you dig into this data set or, or, or really any data set, I want to encourage everyone to, to be pretty careful about checking each stage of the of the processing pipeline, and and make sure you know you're you understand the trade offs that are being made at each of those steps, um, and and be careful about how that's going to impact the, the scientific questions you're you're asking, um, you know. So we we made certain decisions in in you know the quality control of, of this data set. Um, that you know, as, as we've seen, are kind of arguable, um, and I think you know, checking to make sure that our scientific conclusions are, are valid um, as we make different decisions at each stage of that of that processing pipeline is is critical. So that's that's something we're in the middle of now, um, and, and and again, we're still improving our our, our post tracking and our decoding and our kind of encoding models. Um, but but at the same time, we we want to make sure that we're, we're sharing this data as, as quickly as possible, and not kind of holding the data back as we kind of try to perfect each each stage of this process. So that that's the again um, a, a trade off that we 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 have to make. Um, we want to share the data, but we also want to make sure that the, the the data is is as good as possible. So we're certainly going to be kind of editing these data sets um, over the next couple of years as we make improvements in post tracking and as we make improvements in decoding and spike sorting. Um, so so I think it's important to think of these data sets as kind of you know works in progress um, as you as you analyze this data. I hope that that answered the question. So so I, I, I completely agree with your concerns. It's something that we're we're working on um, and you know it's it's important to to remember these these issues as you and as you analyze these data sets, um, but again, these 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 issues are not unique to to the IBL data sets. Um, you'll you'll see these issues in, in really any any data set that you dig into in sufficient depth. Uh, I have a question about the uh, behavioral task. Um, is it fair to say that the setup is very fixed on this particular you know behavioral task design? If you know if there is a lack of flexibility. Um, you know, why did you guys decide on this setup or like strategy? Um, yeah. yeah, thank you. Yeah, great, great question. And I think that's, you know, that's, that's one of the items over here. Um, so yeah, why, why did we choose this task? So, you know, five years ago, we weren't really sure that we could 
pull this off, right? So we purposely chose a pretty simple, not, you know, not cutting edge kind of task that we were sure we could train mice to perform the task. We were pretty sure we could, you know, get the, get the performance up to a level um, across multiple labs so that we could achieve this, this reproducibility, which was kind of critical for the, the goals of the collaboration. Um, but we know, we, we certainly know that there's, there's multiple, uh, multiple things that are, are, are maybe not ideal about this task, or, or maybe, you know, put it this way. This is, if, if this was the only task that, that, that neuroscientists could, could use, you know, we, we'd be in a pretty bad place, right? Um, so we, we know that the, it's a head fits, a head fixed task, um, which, which is, is weird in all kinds of ways. Um, we're looking at, at very highly trained animals. Um, and I, as I already mentioned, it takes a while to train the animals. Um, it's a very non-natural behavior. Um, so I'd, I'd certainly be excited to, to think about versions of the IBL um, that moved away from this task, that used a, a more naturalistic task, right? Um, of course, recording from neuropixels and freely moving animals performing, you know, natural behaviors is itself a challenge. Um, and, and it's going to cause other issues with quality control and, and you know, um, you know, the number of, of neurons you can record from and so on. Um, but I, I think a lot of what we've done, what we've done in terms of, you know, setting up uh, a kind of coherent centralized, you know, histology pipeline or a, or a coherent centralized kind of data processing pipeline, a lot of that could be ported over to, to other tasks. And that's that's certainly something we want to explore in the future. And and we hope that, you know, other collaborations kind of spin up, um, you know, using some of the tools that we've developed, but but on, on other animals or on other tasks. Um, you know, we, we, would, we would certainly consider that a, a win. Um, so concretely, one of the things we're, we're interested in over the next year or so is, is exactly this question of, you know, you know, recording from the same neurons in different tasks. Um, so one thing we're planning to do is, is take some of these, these expert mice, watch them perform the IBL task, but then take them out of the IBL rig and, and put them back in their, in their home cage or, or let them kind of run on a wheel, um, for, perform some other kind of untrained tasks um, on their own, um, monitor behavior, monitor neural activity with, with NeuroPixels probe, um, and and then compare across these 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 different settings to to try to understand um, you know neural encoding in a in a much more kind of um, in a much richer context, much richer kind of behavioral context. So that's that's a project that we're we're currently pursuing, um, and hopefully in a year or so we'll have some some results on this. Did that address the question? Uh, Liam, thank you very much for these talks uh, this morning. Very helpful. My question here is, you showed us some uh, graphical user interfaces to interact with the data that uh, you guys have. I'm wondering, is it part of the goal to share these tools? Um, is it part of the goal of the consortium? So as others, let's say, postdocs running individual projects in other labs, they can input their own data and use this? Or perhaps is it just a solution to interact with your data? Which is fair enough. Yeah. Yeah, great question. So, so all of the above. Um, so, all of all of the tools that we're developing for you know post tracking or decoding or spike sorting or whatever, those those are all fully open source, right? So, if, if we're making improvements on these tools, we want to share those and support those for for community use. Um, and yeah, some of the some of the most useful tools we've developed are on these the, the visualization of of these large data sets. Um, so we're we're making these 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 GUIs um, and these these web services open source. Um, we're actually writing up a, a little paper, kind of um, summarizing, you know, some of some of these methods now. Um, so yeah, we we certainly hope that people use these tools to um, to to look at our data and kind of visualize different different sessions within our data sets. But we hope that people can kind of you know steal <laughs> steal these methods and adapt them for for their own data sets as well. Um, Again, something we've we've learned as part of this collaboration is is how critical it is to have kind of easy, responsive, um, powerful visualization tools. And if if we can kind of push push the the field as a whole um, to to use better better visualization tools, I think that would be a, a major win. 
Great, thank you. Um, I guess a question on on uh, reproducibility uh, and and what that means and what the goals are with these bigger data sets. So, um, uh, I guess my experience in a, in more of an fMRI type domain is we've started to kind of explore these ideas of deep scanning on a single individual versus very broad scanning. Uh, so, you know, getting 10 to 20 hours of task data on a single individual versus scanning 300 individuals uh, for an hour each and just looking at these differences. And of course, we're getting improvements in technology, so we're getting more efficient data collection per minute and, and all of these kinds of things. Um, and and one of the kind of conundrums that's come out of this is that <laughs> we're starting to see that the more we scan an individual, the less they look like other individuals. Um, that is, there's lots of individual variability, which kind of starts to ask a different question about how does this generalize uh, across populations as as a whole. I'm just wondering if you have any thoughts on this. I, I know your your mice are probably highly stereotyped and and highly trained and and and. Um, you probably don't suffer the same kind of heterogeneity that we do pulling people in off the street and throwing them in a scanner tube and seeing what happens. Um, but you get all these kinds of differences, strategic differences, vasculature differences, neural differences, genetic differences, all of these kinds of things. And once we're actually sensitive to all of that variation, what are we generalizing over and, and what becomes the reproducibility of that? Yeah, uh, great question. Um, to stop sharing, the, the connection seems a little choppy there. So um, let me know if you want me to pop, pop up those bullet points again. But but yeah, that's that's definitely something we're grappling with. So a couple, couple kind of data points there. One is that you know I, I emphasized at the beginning that the expert mice um, did look quite reproducible across, across labs. Um, but if you look at the training schedules across labs, you do start to see differences. Um, and you certainly see huge heterogeneity and, you know, some mice pick up the task very quickly. Some mice never pick it up at all. Some, some mice are in the middle. Um, so we, we think the, the training schedule and maybe something about cognitively how the mice kind of understand this task, um, might be wildly heterogeneous across, across individuals. Um, we also believe from looking at behavior of multiple mice and, and the way they turn the wheel and the way they kind of groom themselves um, that you know you can probably fingerprint individual mice based on their behavior if if you if if you're smart enough right if if you do pose tracking kind of accurately enough um, and if you have good enough kind of behavioral models um, that's that's just a hypothesis now this is actually something I know Matt is interested in pursuing in the future now that we have better tracking um, and there's some things you have to be careful about here. You know, maybe maybe one mouse's pose traces look different just because the 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 camera pose was a little different that mouse, or maybe the the the, the image brightness was a little different. So we have to be a little bit careful there. Um, they were not just picking up on on kind of trivial differences. Um, but that's that's definitely something we want to pursue in the future. Um, I, I think it's it's still a hypothesis at this point, but I, I wouldn't be surprised if if we could do behavioral fingerprinting on these mice. Um, now, what that means in terms of reproducibility, I don't know. Um, we'll have to, you know, cross that bridge when we, when we come to it. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, certainly, you know, individual mice are going to have differences. And, and how we kind of treat those differences in our analyses um, is something that, you know, I think we're kind of looking forward to, to grappling with. But we don't have the, the great answer yet. Um, I, I do think that the the fMRI literature is is going to be informative on that score um, as we as we kind of catch up to them in, in certain ways. Okay, I think that's about it, Liam. So thank you again so much for joining us. I think we'll sort of go into lunch next. Um, actually, Matt, do you want to say a few words about the session in the afternoon? Uh, no, I guess we can just wait for the afternoon. Okay, we'll sounds good. So Matt's going to lead the afternoon. He's a lot of cool notebooks prepared, uh, and we'll sort of touch upon all these different ideas in the afternoon. Thank you guys and thank you again Liam for joining us.